Okay. Hello to all of you. We continue on with the uh, discussion of the uh, Chan development via the Chan uh, patriarchs. And we've been talking about Honjin and we're gonna continue and perhaps get to Huayning um, as well. Uh, but there's so much uh, material here that um, to go through it in too quick of an, of an order would be very, very sad. I wanna give you a flavor of this and I wanna give you a flavor based on right view on how we, um, we present the material to this day um, and what were the main doctrinal uh, elements that were there and developing and remembering that at that point in time, um, when the Chan patriarchs were coming out, this material was new, but actually the material, a lot of the material was 500 years old, even at that time, maybe older than that by the time it had reached uh, China. And then when it had reached China, there was what's called the sinification. Um, I don't know if it's sinification or sinification, um, a changing of it, of a flavor of, of, uh, from the, the Chinese culture. Um, but by and large, it held true to its form. Um, the, the Chinese were very good at preserving the, the main schools that were coming in from India, from, from the Dharma to the Madhyamika to the Yogacara school. They put their own spins on it and developed the Hua Yen school, um, the Tian Tai school, um, and the Wei, uh, Shen Wei Shulin school. Um, and uh, so, so those schools kind of uh, echoed what was there from before, and those kind of gave this kind of a, a flavor to, to Buddhism from the indigenous um, uh, uh, doctrines of Confucianism and Taoism. Um, and again, it, it maintained this wonderful idea of just mind and, and the impact of having something that um, was contemplated as this mind. Uh, the, the difficulty that we have in presenting Chan is that it's beyond words and phrases. Um, so it's not so much of a teaching as an invitation to investigate and to cultivate uh, mind. This has to be done by uh, each and every one of you to look into mind. And it's essentially saying, okay, here is... Here's where you'll find the cable, you know, but we cannot hook it up for you. You have to do it yourself. And then what you find is that instead of having this, just this programming that is um, uh, broadcasting samsara, there's this programming that is broadcasting things that are in inconceivable. And the range of, of, uh, information is incredible. We as, as human sentient beings have a very limited range of, of hearing. Dogs can hear much better than us, sight. Uh, eagles can definitely see, see better than us. Uh, you know, smell, all those things. Um, we have a very limited range of comfort um, in terms of, of where we're at. If you don't believe me, just, you know, on a summer day, you know, just let the therm thermostat go and then see how comfortable you are or on a cold day for the heater. And so it's interesting. We have this very narrow range, yet we believe we're the um, masterminds of the universe. And um, it, it's interesting to see things in this way, uh, this kind of a um, egocentric viewpoint that we have, and this egocentric viewpoint is what prevents us from being able to realize mind. Um, the real realization of mind comes in two ways. Uh, the first one is, is that there's a realization from a doctrinal side that there, there exists mind apart from ego apart from consciousness. 
it is essentially the platform for which everything is created. And when we when we uh, look at the world in this way, it changes things because we are no longer at the center of it. We are essentially um, omniscient in our perception. But we can't do that from the samsaric side. That in itself requires a gnosis or a direct experience of, of mind. So from the very beginning, there was this invitation to practice and what the masters were doing and still do is present to you that potential of what, um, what is there that we cannot see. There was a, a saying that I had heard from many, many years ago, even before I became a Buddhist that just enthralled me. And, and, uh, and it said that what appears to be real is unreal and what appears to be unreal is real. And if you play with that a bit and you play with it from the samsaric viewpoint and then saying, okay, if, if I believe that this is real and it's really unreal, then what is real? And that's what we're looking for is the real. The us, the sentient being, cannot perceive that, but that which runs, let's say, at least for the, mo for the moment, runs in tandem with the sentient consciousness can, and, and that is mind itself. We perceive mind as something that, that's separate and apart, something to get, and from the other side, Sentient beings are simply a projection upon mind. When we begin to understand that, then this is doctrinally, at least we're that far. And then we have to experience it ourselves. So what these masters are doing at, in all this time period is that they are, are trying to... Um, bring us to that kind of, of a realization. So let's go back to Holmgren. And again, we're talking about the, his treatise on the essentials of, of cultivating mind. And again, this is the essentials of what you need. And, and in this part, it is a bit of question and answer, um, but they're, they're very, very good questions. So the first question, um, that I will talk about is it says, why is maintaining awareness of the mind the essential gateway for en entering the path? So maintaining this awareness of the mind, this is essential. It's the gateway for entering the path. So we have always talk about the gateless gate or that this path is not something that's real, but it is leads to what is real. And then when we lead to it, it does not negate the phenomenal world because the phenomenal world is real within the context of mind, but is impermanent. So it in itself cannot uh, support the idea of mind, but it is a projection within mind, but it's a real projection. And so then the other aspect is, is that it, it is the gateway to the reality of things, which is that, that everything is mind. So the answer is the Buddha teaches that even actions seemingly trivial as raising the fingers of a single hand to draw an image of a Buddha can create merit as great as the sands of the Gange River. However, this is just a way of, of enticing foolish sentient beings to create super karmic conditions whereby they will see the Buddha and become enlightened in the future. If you wish to achieve Buddhahood quickly in your own body, maintain awareness of the true mind. 
So it's very interesting because there's, um, let's say, a, two levels of presentation of the Dharma here. So the first level of the presentation of the Dharma is when they're saying, oh, you know, if you draw a picture of the Buddha, then that will create an incredible power in you. So everybody's starting to draw pictures of the Buddha to make a connection in this way. This is the samsaric side. This is the side, if we expanded this to say, follow the paramitas, the 37 factors of enlightenment, the eightfold path, and it will lead you to, to the, the, the true path. Or what you can do is if you wish to achieve Buddhahood quickly in your own mind, maintain awareness of the true mind. Now, maintaining the awareness of the true mind works simply because maintaining the awareness of the true mind is the Buddha mind. It's the Buddha mind without obstructions. The more that you can maintain this, the easier it is to maintain it, and the longer you're going to be able to maintain it. It is the shortcut to, to the practice. The other ways are expedient means that we use to bring about uh, people that have yet to, to truly understand, but to those that have an ability, then right away you, you go to this, and those, uh, even if they don't have ability, if they do this, they can advance very quickly. Sometimes I'm very surprised and I see someone new come in and they jump up so high in their level. So, so very, very quickly because simply they, they buy into it and then they practice very, very hard in terms of, of doing that. And I remember when I was young and, um, I was studying Kung Fu and I was learning, uh, Negong, um, using Negong power in, in the Kung Fu. And my teacher would always tell me, you have to, <sighs> and he really developed this Negong. And finally, you know, I was able to do that. And then he said, you know, um, another way you can do that is just simply go, I go, why didn't you teach me that in the very beginning? And he goes, because you wouldn't have understood it. But, and you, then you have the nay going right in that moment. But th that kind of feeling is the same as what I just did, but, but I didn't need to do this. But it's a matter of the gnosis of the realization of what the nay going feels like in order for one to be able to do that. Likewise, in this practice, when you have that, you have, um, I have to kind of settle down because the Nagel came <laughs> very quickly. Uh, but in any case, um, it, it's the same. You just maintain this awareness, maintain it, maintain it. And then one day, boom, it's there. It doesn't mean that you're enlightened, but you have a feeling of what mind, it, the potentiality of mind can be, okay? Um, and he says, the Buddhas of the past, present, future are incalculable and infinite in number. And every single one of them achieve Buddhahood by maintaining awareness of the true mind. So if you want to be with the Buddhas and the patriarchs, maintain this awareness of the true mind. So what is this awareness of the true mind that, that they talk about? It's just simply being in the present moment and being aware of everything in a state of equanimity. And in this state, uh, I think the Theravada called this the highest jhana, um, we are aware of what is arising, what is falling, what is running through mind, through our consciousness and appearances in mind, emotions, um, any kind of mental impressions or sensations whatsoever, the mind is aware of those in a way in which they are given an equal value. So if they have an equal value, then, then the mind stays very, very, very calm. 
And um, I'll give you an example. I, I told the story before, but to me, I, I found it very, very funny, you know, of when one is um, uh, taken away by their sensations. Uh, I was once in court um, and uh, in, in the court in Riverside, it's a very old, old court with marble all over the place and it echoes in there. And then there's, um, I was talking to this one attorney about our case and and out of the corner of the eye, I saw some some beautiful woman walking by, and she had uh, high heels on, and they were clicking on the on the the marble, <laughs> and she had a very form fitting dress. And the attorney catches her, and he's talking to me, and he literally is watching her and going click 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 and just watching her and his head's actually bobbing up and down to the motion she's making with her body and and I had to laugh because I went like where's your your attention you know you you didn't even bother to I'm thinking in my head you didn't even bother to, to realize that you were talking to me and then you just simply just watch this lady go by you know and and totally lost the presence of, of the moment and then he came back you know a bit flustered um but the thing is is it can be anything like this it could be a candy apple you know it could be whatever something that you drop your glass uh, something that shatters that tranquility in the moment something that allures you or that you want to move away from that disturbs the mind when the mind is disturbed then you lose this awareness you can bring it by, back by realizing, ah, my awareness was gone because it was disturbed by these sensations. Let go of the sensation. So you let go of it, and then you know, and you let go of the letting go. That's important. So you have to let go of the letting go. It's not just simply saying, just let go. You have to let go of everything. And when you do that, People, they're not used to that because they need some kind of a conscious anchor to, to hold themselves in position. And their conscious anchor is actually the opposite. You simply grasping onto one sensation, to another sensation, to another one, just like some kind of... Um, a Tarzan going through the, the jungle, grabbing one vine and the next vine and then the next one and next one and thinking that they're staying in place. But it doesn't work that way. If we just simply let go of the vines, we will remain where we're at. Even if we're walking, we are walking in stillness because in that moment, all we're doing is we're just being very, very calm we're aware, we're allowing the mind to, to monitor all of the sensations, all of the appearances in mind. So if we hear, oh, there's a fire bell that's going uh, off, then no, what would we do in that moment? We don't just say, ah, it's a fire bell. It doesn't matter because, because I'm in a state of equanimity. If I burn, I burn. No, it follows function. So whatever the function is in that moment, which can be um, uh, prioritized by something else, then it moves to that function if there's a reason to do that. So for instance, if you are in a restaurant, now, oftentimes this happens, where some waiter will drop a tray of plates or something, a very loud sound. And so when I'm with people and that happens, they go <gasps> like this, they get so frightened. And, and, and they're going, what is that? And they want to see what happened. But surely by the sound of it, you can clearly tell what happened that that some waiter had dropped a, a tray of plates. It has nothing to do with you. 
unless it's close to you and you can go and help them pick up the plates. But if it's from across the room, let him do his job. It's okay. So it has nothing to do. But the mind can prioritize. And if it hears a fire bell, then it's aware of the fire bell. And so what would, what would you do if you heard a fire bell? Nobody's going to do anything. They're just going to stay there still and burn to a crisp. What are the priorities? Yes, Rue. I would leave the building. You would leave? Leave the building. Yeah, that's that's what they teach you in, in like kindergarten on up, right? Anybody else? Nobody? You're all just going to leave the building? Yes, Lewis. Oh, let Harry up first. Go ahead. Oh. You look around to see if you could help someone. You know, I mean, you'd have um, presence of mind, and then and then leave with them uh, if if it's safe, and and then leave. All right. Anybody else? There's no like pass or fail on this, unless you just stay there doing nothing. No. Lewis said something. But you're you. He's like. All right, Mark, go ahead. Yeah, in, in addition to the others, I'm gonna try and address the situation, maybe put the fire out or contact emergency services. All right, uh, first ascertain if there's a fire or if it's just a, a, like somebody's doing a false alarm. And then we look to see, you know, where we're at, are we on the third floor? You know, are we on the 33rd floor? Are we on the first floor? Are there people that need to be uh, escorted out? Can we help in any way to put the fire out? So all of these things are function in the present moment. Um, so uh, we, this is what we do and it's representative of Mahayana. And as a Mahayana, we're in a burning building. No. Um, Elvis left a long time ago. He didn't take anybody with him, but you can. And so, so, so that's the point is, is that in Mahayana, we look around to see if there's somebody we can take with us and we try to take as many as we can. And then we go back in again and try to take them again. And so this is something that's, that's very important, how we function because this is mind. So you see the difference in terms of it. Our initial reaction will be, let's get the heck out of Dodge. Let's go outside, you know, and watch the building burn down or whatever. But others looking around saying, you know, maybe there's an, um, an 80 year old woman there, you know, um, that you can take out, you know, um, or whatever it is, uh, put the fire out, whatever. But there's functions there that aren't based on an egocentric approach. And so we are capable of using mind in this way. And so uh, the reason I mention this is so that you don't think that mind is some kind of an altruistic, you know, um, uh, thing that, that is inert or inactive. It cares. It cares, and in this world, it functions in this way to try to to address things and and to to help people as as they're needed. Um, and so, when we don't need it, then we put it aside. When I put it aside, then Gilbert doesn't cause any trouble. When it, when Gilbert's at the forefront, you know he's he's a troublemaker. You know he can get me in trouble quite a bit. But if I leave him alone, then it's all right. No. And of course, I have to serve the function of him as a, um, as a, uh, um, a, a human being with a family and everything. But now, you know, my family grows. You know, not only do I have my bloodline family, but I've got this Chan family that I've got to take care of. 
and and the the children yet to be born. So it's kind of an interesting thing. It, it's a different way of looking at things, but this is the true awareness of mind. So I don't want you to, to get confused as to what awareness is. It's functional, it's dynamic, and it's spontaneous. Okay, remember that. Functional, dynamic, and spontaneous. It, it changes along with, with everything that's there. It is in harmony with the environment and it seeks to improve the environment so that's important okay any questions about that lewis had a, a comment that he, he couldn't unmute um his answer the answer he was going to say was i that he lives in a wooden house so he would use his fire extinguisher first before clearing the house all right Okay, we, we continue on. Why is maintaining the true mind the basic principle of the entire Buddhist canon? You see, all the stuff I've been, I've been presenting to you, it's mind work, right? There's a reason why it's mind work, because it represents the entire Buddhist canon. Throughout the canon, the Tathagata preaches extensively about all types of transgressions and good fortunes, causes and conditions, um, rewards and retributions. Um, uh, he also draws upon various things of this world, mountains, rivers, earth, plants, trees, etc., to make innumerable metaphors. So we see that all through the Nikayas, and there, there's all these things in terms of the Buddha and how the Buddha was in a different lifetime and whatever. And we talk about things, that, how they move or whatever. Very poetic. Uh, and, uh, and then he continues. He also manifests innumerable supernatural or supernormal powers and various kinds of transformations. So he can transform into different things. All these are just the Buddha's way of teaching foolish sentient beings. This is big words for Hongjin here. He's going and saying, hey, you know what? This is all, you know, what I call um, putting the pacifier in the baby's mouth to stop it from crying. He's going right to it. He's cutting all of that and saying, yeah, you can do that, you know, because you're a foolish sentient being. Why are you a foolish sentient being? Because you think that there's something there that you need to, so to, to uh, salvage from this world or transform from this world. Since they have various kinds of desires and a myriad of psychological differences, and some of us manifest a myriad of psychological differences just in one day. Um, the Tathagatha draws them into permanent bliss according to their mental tendencies. Understand clearly that the Buddha nature embodied within sentient beings is inherently pure. Like the sun underlaid by clouds, here comes a metaphor, um, by just distinctly Maintaining awareness of the true mind, the clouds of false thought will go away and the sun of wisdom will appear. So I don't know whether he's preaching to foolish sentient beings or not with that comment. Why make any further study of knowledge based on the senses, which only leads to the suffering of samsara? All concepts as well as affairs of the three periods of time should be understood according to the metaphor of polishing a mirror. When the dust is gone, the nature naturally becomes manifest. That which is learned by the ignorant mind is completely useless. True learning is that which is learned 
by the inactive or unconditioned Wu Wei mind, which never ceases correct mindfulness. Now, do you agree 100% with what he said? This is going up a couple of levels. Anything that he said that you wouldn't agree with, or you think that that's all correct. It's another Gilbert's charm trick. Harry, a brave one. A, Go ahead. Brave. No, well, I mean, there seems to be a, a simple trick in the polishing of the metaphor, mirror metaphor, which come, you know, which which Wei Nung will turn around. You know, right. that there's nothing, yeah, nothing to polish. Yeah, very interesting, right? Because this is Hong Ren. We don't have um, Hui Ning yet at this point. And so why don't you explain that a little bit more? Well, it, that, that's the, the, the two poems, right? There, one is by what, um, Shen Hui, who writes the, um, the first one, you know. Yeah, the, Shen the, Shu. Chen, Shen Shu, thank you. Um, the body it, um, is a... Uh, well, anyway, the mind is a mirror stand and um, you have to polish it, polish it and let no dust to light. And then allow me, on. allow me. Yeah. I mean, I'm uh, just doing our, it our body is a Bodhi tree. Our mind is a mirror bright. Carefully, we wipe them uh, away and let no dust to light. That was what Shen Shu right. said, which is what Hongren said. Yeah. And then Wei Nung said there's something like there is no there is no um maybe there is no mirror there is no mirror stand um there's nothing there's nowhere for the dust to alight yeah something so, like that so he said originally there's no no bodhi tree nor mirror stand bright since uh, all is void here it says void it could be all is empty where can there be less dust to alight or excuse me where can dust alight so, so one of them saying that it's, it's all of this is the nature of emptiness where the other one is moving towards emptiness and polishing and polishing, is, which is what your point is, right? Yeah. And anything else? Yeah, Joe, Joe Kobeck makes the point that um, you need both of them, <laughs> at least at some point. I'm sorry, the, I missed the... You oh, yeah, the, the Charlotte Joe Kobeck, the Zen teacher, when she talks about this, she says, that we need both both those points of view at different times. You know, I yeah, mean, there's a certain point where you, you have to polish it, and a certain time when you realize there's nothing to polish. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it's kind of a, a it appears to be a, a fudging of that, but not really. I, I mean, so your point is a good one in terms of that, whether we say which one is right. In, in terms of this, but that's that's important. Let me go to Mark and then Lewis, if he, Lewis is, looks like his hand appeared. Go ahead, Mark. I think it's, um, the answer to your question is, who is there to agree or disagree? It's mine, it's mine reflecting mine. It can be this way, yes. And so it, that's good. You added a little bit better dimension there, or newer dimension. And, and I reflect back to the lecture from last week. I can't fully make the connection, but the similar, the met metaphor, you know, the seeking the reflection in the transparent mirror. Yes. Yeah, that's. Well, we lost your voice. Yeah, but sorry, I, I clicked on the. It's button. all right. It's all right. I'm back. Okay. Um, so I wasn't going to say any bad words either. So, but um, yes, I since I I heard that um, that one, I I've been contemplating that, and I was thinking about what Michael was talking about. Uh, um, some other one that I had used of transparent fish, and it actually made it a little even more dynamic of this uh, transparent mirror. Um, there, but I, I, it's a good it's a good uh, analogy to take a look at or metaphor to 
to kind of uh, uh, help look into mine. Yeah. Okay. Lewis? I, I think Michael would know this quote, and I think it was that Schrodinger said, there is just one mind. He said a little bit more, but I think that also is, is um, part of the energy. And uh, for me, for me to, to read that and to understand it, he said something else, which I can't remember the rest of the quote, but most of it was that there's just one mind. Yeah. I, I will give you a story of mine. Um, I probably tell it every couple of years. Maybe I've, I've told it more often than that uh, as my fading memory or my growing ego. Um, but um, there was once where Shifu was talking about this and he was saying the practice is like you have a plate and you have this plate and it has a lot of dust on it. And you just gently blow the dust off and the plate is so polished and clear. And so he asked the students in the retreat, what do you think of this analogy? Um, or, and, um, and everybody was going, oh, Shifu, that's so clear. That's very, very, very clear. Uh, I, that's amazing, that, that's great. And then I raised my hand and Shifu looks at me kind of with one eye like that. And he, and he said, Gilbert, and I, I said, Shifu, I was just wondering, where did the dust go? And he looked at me and he went, where did the dust go? I go, yeah, just wondering, where did the dust go? And he's going, Gilbert, you're so foolish. You just ruined my analogy. How could you do that? You know, that's so stupid of you. Where did the dust go? And so he was berating me and, um, and the people were there, you know, in, in the retreat going, I, I can't believe he said that. He's so stupid, you know. But do you understand what the question is, or was, is where did the dust go? Because it's like the, the uh, originally there's no Bodhi tree nor mere stand bright since all is void, where can the dust alight? But if there's dust, where is the dust? It's mind. It's mind. So, so if you blow that, can you blow the dust off of the mirror? Does it matter? you see and so just as a, a, a side that evening then Shifu called me into his his quarters to talk more about this um and but the thing is is that it's kind of what like Harry was saying with the one uh person that was saying well they're they're mutually compatible they're mutually compatible if one has right view if one doesn't have right view, they appear to be a contradiction. This idea of wiping the mirror and the other one is that this sudden enlightenment, the subitism uh, of Hui Ning, they're, they're, they're still mutually compatible. And Hui Ning, although that they made this whole thing about Shen Shu was so stupid and whatever, you know, and they really made him look bad because made him a fraidy cat that he wrote on the wall and stuff where I'm getting ahead of myself here rather than saying it outright or giving giving the his script to uh, Hong Jin. Um, there, there's something to be said, but again, this is where Hong Jin is pointing and saying, this is one level. This is another level. You still need this one to get to here, but you can never lose sight of this and you can never just do this here, this level, because you'll never get anywhere with that. It just doesn't take you because there, it's, there, there is no invitation to, to mind. So when we practice, we have to practice with the idea of inviting people to mind to contemplate and when they have this then they can jump to here or they can develop it so Sentha has an epiphany to share with us let's see I was just thinking that this um this analogy the mirror analogy 
you know, you could think of it as practice um, according to the three turnings. The first turning practice is wiping the wiping the mirror, wiping the mirror off, free of dust, free of dust, so that so that it becomes really apparent that there's the mirror there. And maybe you would never get to recognize the mirror if you didn't wipe the dust clear. So that's the, that could be thought of as a first turning. The second turning would be what Huenang said, that there is no mirror, there's no dust. There never was. So that's the shunyata. And the third turning is that uh, dust has Buddha nature too. Um, you know, and that is uh, maybe the, the Huenang's another, when he talks to Wolun, I think, when he says Huenang has a bit of, you know, a, a thousand thoughts. Um, so, so that would be the, the Buddha nature, the third turning of uh, practice. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And, and this is the way that we look at things to try to, uh, to assist others when, when we begin to do this um, and, and able to, to penetrate what I'm saying so that it's not just me saying in my own words, I want you also to try to, to work on that. This is very important. Harry's coming back with another epiphany. No, I just wanted to mention that there's a Kagyu practice, you know, from in, in the Vajrayana where they talk about um, building up from the bottom and swooping down from above. And it's, I, I think it's, it's analogous to what you're talking about building up from the bottom is that you're you're looking at your experience of suffering in the moment and you're 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 um you're maintaining your awareness of that the the built swooping down from above is um having a um in the, just the purity of mind is the concentration and everything that falls away from that is is there's kind of a comparison so it's like two different things that which are appropriate at different times according to what's going on in your practice. Yeah, it's very interesting because Theravadan practice and also the Tibetans have different ways of, of approaching this and, and developing the concentration of the mind. Um, and for us looking into samsara, we begin to concentrate on it. And there's all sorts of different practices from the, from the um, Theravadans and and their practices of maintaining concentration to the Vajrayana uh, of um, looking at images and trying to concentrate on images from the Tibetan side. Um, uh, but then we have also in Tibetan the Do Dochen and the Dochen is very close to Chan. And um, I would say they're, they're one and the same in, in the ultimate. Um, and, and that's just simply seeing things as they are um, and maintaining that awareness there. Um, so it, it's very, very interesting when, um, when we see things in, in, in this way. Um, there was a, one uh, a Chan master, Moheon, uh, who had debated with a Tibetan master and there was a whole big thing made up about it. And they, and they based, the Tibetans based their study on the fact that the Tibetan master beat the Chan master, but it really wasn't in that way in terms of that there was a misapplication in terms of that, but it, it didn't matter what, what, what mattered was again, at this kind of a, a way of looking at things where the Mohyan was looking at it from the idea of subitism and, and a sudden enlightenment doesn't mean that one becomes completely enlightened. It is just one is able to see their true nature. And that's that's an important step in the practice because one can be, do all the visualization they want, but if they do not see their true nature, it's just visualization. And, and, and it's no better than the concentration of Theravadan. But if one can develop in the Theravadan Vipassana, or one can have... An, an, an enlightening experience, I call it in quotes, enlightening experience where one at least sees the true nature of mind, that is something. And so when we look at this in terms of how we understand it, we have to look at that in terms of the context of where we're going. 
this is very important. I'm very happy with the way that you're participating, all of you, because of the fact that this is so important in terms of finding out, okay, there's some sara here and, and in this inquiry into this matching halves of seeing things and not discarding some sara, not discarding the sentient being, but not seeing the sentient being as someone that is separate and apart and his own Buddha rather than part of Buddha mind. And, and seeing things in this way, it, it, it changes the factors because we go from the many to the one and from the one to the zero. But the zero is not the zero um, of, uh, you know, the, the mathematics, the basic mathematics, but it's the zero that I would think um, Michael would look at and say, it contains everything. No, it's a different kind of a zero. It's the zero of the Mayans. And so, so when you look at things in this way, it, it's, it's interesting, you know, because it doesn't, it's like Nagarjuna, it doesn't negate the apparent reality or confirm it. And likewise, the same with, with absolute reality. This is very interesting because now we're zeroing in at where we should be practicing. This is Holmgren. What we're talking about is what Holmgren's talking about here. Yes, uh, Ian. Um, well, I've just been, I've got this open in, in another window. So I keep on looking at it over and over again. And sort of what is standing out to me is like the metaphor of polishing the mirror is a very correct way of understanding when it's having to do with concepts. And so it's all concepts should be understand according to this metaphor. And when those um, conceptual barriers are penetrated, then the nature naturally becomes manifest. It's not that the concepts actually depart. It's that they're non-conceptual truth, like the, that the concepts themselves are just mind is, is, is realized. And there's the zero. There's the, the zero of not, you know, the, the like nothing and, and everything, but I mean, it is that zero which contains the whole to the point where there's where the one returns to. And so it's kind of an interesting way of looking at it. Mark, you had your hand still up. Do you have a comment? Oh, no, yes, no? Yeah, I have a, a comment. Um, I think it, we return to the whole when the apparent reality collapses. And what resonates for me, again, I think it was from the last lecture, you made the comment to Rob or something that came from Rob, is if it moves, it's illusory. And so what clicked for me is, all right, if, it's if it moves and it's illusory, then everything collapses. Time and space collapse, it doesn't exist. Yeah. And so the dream, the dream collapses, it just caves in. Yes. It's it is um keep going. It and you just fall right in the hole. I already fell in it. The the W H O L E hole. So uh, yeah, it's very interesting because of that. It, it's it's something that um, Shifu would say. He he said to me, "Oh, I didn't realize I didn't have my lights on. I'll probably blind myself now. Sorry. Now you probably can see me a little better. But I got these carnival lights that are on my face. Um, but uh, in in any case, um, it he says. But remember, it only stops for you." Okay. So, okay. So any other questions or I'll move on. So I'm, I'm accomplishing what I wanted to do with this by virtue of your participation, which I, I, I I'm very, very happy um, about. Um, although I think uh, we're, we have been dropping some people that might be, you know, not quite clear about, you know, the profoundness of this, but I, this is good stuff. I mean, really, really good good stuff because it it enables you to become a, 
a great Chan practitioner and scholar and study and and, and that's important so that you understand what 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 is going on here. You'll never be uh, lose a debate with a Tibetan. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Understand clearly the Buddha nature and body within sentient beings is inherently pure. Oh, I think I read that. I'm sorry. Um, I read all that. Okay. Um, this is kind of a refrain, but a little bit adding to it. One must maintain clear awareness of the true mind without generating false thoughts or the illusion of personal possession. And this is interesting because we don't generate false thoughts. What, are, what is a false thought? I'm so smart, or I'm nothing, I'm worthless, or I'm this, I'm that, or whatever, or I, I want um, you know, something, uh, or possessions, this is mine, this is my thought, this is my environment, whatever it is. When we create the idea of personal possessions, then including um, emotions is very important. Emotions can be very insidious to us. No, you go, but no, but I, I want to be able to, to love the little tiny, you know, baby raccoon, you know, I, I want that. But what about the baby rat? Can you do no, it's a rat, you know? Uh, but that's personal possessions. Your concept <laughs> as they are okay all right and continues to understand that the buddha does not actually preach the dharma having sufficiently listened to the buddhist preachings therefore maintaining awareness of the true mind is the basic principle of the entire canon so here comes you know and he's saying if you understand this, then you're not a foolish sentient being and you understand that there's nothing to teach. And, and again, it's the one saying, well, then why am I learning from you? You're learning from me until you realize that I have nothing to teach. And, and so it's very, very important because it brings us to what all of you are talking about, whether you were talking about infinity or zero or the whole or whatever, it brings you right to that point. How can you teach that? You can't teach that. But one can experience it. When I say the one can experience it, it is mind that experiences, not, not the sentient being. So the next question is, um, why is maintaining awareness of the mind the patriarch of all the Buddhas of the past, present, and future? Ah, this is a bit of the phrase that we always use. Do you remember, Eon, you have your hand up still. What, what is the phrase we always use? I'm sorry, I was, I was reading ahead. It was, it was up from earlier. Ah, I see, overachiever. You were in the present <laughs> moment. To know yeah. the Buddhas of the past, present, and future, perceive that all Dharma Dattu nature is created by mind. There you go. So, so he's he's hanging it out there for you, okay? And he's going, look, while maintaining awareness of the mind, the patriarch uh, of all the Buddhas of the past, present, and future, what is the patriarch? The mind. It is the mind. The patriarchs are the mind. They're not representing individuals. They're representing mind. That's why Hong Jin said to Hui Ning, after you, it's over. Otherwise, people are going to confuse it as some form of a dy dynastic period that I'm conferring upon you, um, Buddha nature, that you inherently have, but everybody has it. We are just surrogates for the Buddha. So he's saying here, uh, the awareness of the mind, the patriarch of, of, of the Buddhas of the past, present, and future is just simply this awareness of mind. So it runs all the way through. Maintaining the awareness of the mind is the Buddha nature. Maintaining the Buddha nature, one sees everything so clearly. There, where would you go? You wouldn't go anywhere. Where would the dust alight? 
Where did the dust go? It doesn't matter. It's seen clearly. These are just simply convention. And um, so when we, um, we see this, hold on. Okay. All right. I think the sent this responding to those. All right. And then, so it says, when you do not generate false thoughts, the Buddha's generated, um, the Buddhas are generated within your consciousness. Very interesting. Remember, because we're trying to wonder what is consciousness, right? Is consciousness something that is fabricated? Is, is consciousness um, a thing? Or is it awareness? And when we, when we create a thing out of it, it's appear in accordance with causes and conditions. When we let the causes and conditions go, it's the transparent mirror. Consciousness is just mind, unobstructed. This is very important because we've got to contemplate this. We've got to look into this to see what consciousness is in relationship to other things because we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We want to make sure that that consciousness is there. Now, all of this, you know, some of you are catching it, some of you aren't. It's okay. Hang in there with this because little by little, you'll get closer to it. You're not afraid of it. You're not bored. You're not, oh, this is way over my head type thing. Hang in there. It pays off. Okay. Um, you will only achieve Buddhahood by maintaining awareness of the true mind. You will only achieve Buddhahood. You cannot do it from the paramitas, the 37 factors of the Eightfold Path. It'll just make you a better sentient being. And maybe you might be able to make the jump, but it will take you a few kalpas. And, and the shortcut is just seeing everything's created by mind. Use the mind that you have. Just use it, use it well. Like Master Ling Chi said, now that you have it, use it well. When you need to use it, use it. When you don't need to use it, don't use it. How simple is that? How incredibly simple is that? Just this mind. Therefore, maintaining awareness of the mind is the patriarch of all the Buddhas of the past, present, and future. If one were to expand upon the four previous topics, how could one ever explain them completely? So he's saying, if I was going to expand on whatever we're talking about now, how could we ever explain them completely? We can't. You know, when, when I was approaching this um, uh, uh, lecture today, I go, I have probably three to five hours worth of material. How am I going to present that? No. You can't, but you present what you can in expedient means in accordance with the audience that you're presenting it to. Obviously, this is not something that I would necessarily present in this detail on a, a, um, a Sunday morning uh, lecture. This is something a little, or a general lecture. This is something very, very deep, extremely deep, but I think you guys can handle it. And so it says, my only desire is, to, is that you discern the fundamental mind for yourselves. So you discern it. How do you discern it? By looking into mind and you discern mind, the fundamental mind that's there. And, and so um, it's like uh, in a computer, you have the operating system and then you have all the programs that run off of it. But if the program thinks it runs by itself, it's foolish. And if it wants to be a better program without tapping into the, um, what do you guys call it? The, the main operating system program, whatever it is. Um, but that's the one that, that runs everything. It's transparent. It enables the other programs to appear. It doesn't interfere with them. <laughs> Therefore, I sincerely tell you Make effort, make effort. Um, and he says, I base my teaching on the Lotus Sutra in which the Buddha says, I have presented you with a great cart and a treasure of valuables. 
including bright jewels and wondrous medicines. Even so, you do not take them. What extreme suffering. Alas, alas, if you can cease generating false thoughts and illusions of personal possessions, then all the various types of merits will become perfect and complete. Do not try to search outside of yourself, which only leads to the suffering of some sorrow. So is what Ling Chi used to say, people these days, they cut off their heads and then begin looking for their heads. And, and so uh, I, you can see where Ling Chi got this. I mean, it's very incredible how, how this was, is all presented. Um, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And you see the roots of Chan all the way through this. And during this time period, you know, I, I'm going to see if I can pull in some other of the non uh, patriarch um, Chan masters that echo this so that you can see um, how they approach these, these topics, but they, they served as a standard bearers for, for Chan. And again, they are clear. I mean, these are very um, well educated in, in their ways. They know they've read sutras or they've heard the sutras. They, they know about that, yet they know the limitations of the sutras as well. So we'll stop there. Thank you all for listening to, to the uh, lecture and um, I'll take questions. No questions. Oh, Harry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'd just like you to co comment on this in terms of what, what you've been talking about, of uh, only looking at, at mind as mind and not distinguishing it um, uh, or confusing it with what we think consciousness is. So once we ask Washing Fasher a question, which was, can, um, can an enlightened person go to the bathroom without saying, I have to go to the bathroom. So we, and he basically said, yes. And the same thing can be said of, can you be um, hungry and eat without the, um, you know, uh, ordinary functioning without the intercession of, um, of an ego? So I just want, would like you to uh, comment if you would. Well, going to the bathroom, is that with or without diarrhea? Um, everything's included. <laughs> because uh, I think in my poor, sorrowful life, I've had many times when I didn't have to think about going to the bathroom. Um, no, it's kind of one of those will he make it or Betty don't type of situations. But uh, sorry, it's like bathroom humor. Um, but the, the thing is, is that that everything is in this way, whether one takes a, a drink of water, one one enjoys uh, eating a strawberry. Today I had some strawberries and I, I enjoyed the taste of the strawberries. I was aware of the strawberries. And, I, um, and then once the strawberries are gone, but for this mention of them, you know, they, they are out of mind. But one experiences and what, that is in the consciousness, okay? Um, don't confuse consciousness with I. That's that's the tricky part. That's the I should say that's the sticky part. So when we confuse consciousness with I, then we mess it up because then we create the ego within mind, and and so we think that this ego or this um, then sprouts a red meatball. And, and then we think that we are this red meatball that's going around eating, pooping, singing, whatever, working. Um, but it isn't, it isn't in this way. And, and so your question is a very good question. So what did Goshingfa say? say oh, well, he, he, went, he went at great length that various factors would, would come in, into mind um, where he would find, you know, he'd find that it would be necessary for him him to go and relieve himself, but he would wouldn't it wouldn't be um, caught up in 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 what we would normally think of as consciousness. All of the causes and conditions would would come together 
and and it, just like you were talking about the the fire alarm, that sort of thing, then you know function follows, um, you know um, causes and conditions, you know with wisdom with wisdom states. Yes, I I think that that's that's correct in terms of what he's saying. Um, no, in terms of that is it just simply uh, one uses the consciousness in the proper way. Um, so we. Um, the more we interject the self into the situation, the, the more we move away from, uh, from this pure action of whatever we do, whether it's eating or, or anything else, you know, in terms of that and, and being mindful about how to, to do things. Um, you know, um, I, I have a, a, a bunch of bonsai trees and I water them, but I have to be very mindful when I give them water not to overwater them or not to pour the water on too, too fast and knock off all of the stones and everything there, you know, but making sure they're all adequately watered. And, and it's just simply performing the function. There is a beauty to it, a naturalness and a, a chin, a chin, a chan quality to doing that. Um, in terms of, of that. And, um, and that takes me through the day to the more mundane things that I do and carry out those mundane activities with that same spirit of Tron. And, and it makes life so much better. I mean, even when we have the bad times, we understand that these are bad times. We understand that. And, and um, we don't necessarily have to interject the I. The I is what causes the suffering. Of course, we can feel pain or we can feel discomfort or whatever, but we need not have to suffer from that. And there's a di difference. And that's the I that it comes into the consciousness that is transitory, but has tricked the mind into thinking that it's, it is the, the mind king, which it's not. Yeah, Gilbert, so you, you said you ate some strawberries today, right? So yeah. that's in your memory, right? So you don't have to conf conflate that memory with a sense of I, but you can you can relate to people that you had you ate strawberries, but you don't have to be. Um, I mean, you can hold those things in mind without attaching to them. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, if the strawberry season goes by, then you know I'm not there going. I wish it was strawberry season. You know, <laughs> um, although if somebody told me about a strawberry, you know, I can't say that my mouth won't. Um, due to causes and conditions, you know, salivate, you know, with that in the off seasons or whatever. But I don't have the idea that I, as soon as the lecture is over, I'm going to go to the refrigerator and eat a whole bunch more strawberries. You know, um, no, that donuts might be a different thing, but that's why I don't keep the house full of donuts. So I'm, I'm not that great of a practitioner yet. So, okay, David. Oh, okay. Thank you, Gilbert. Um, this was kind of a hard one to follow. I'm going to have to go back, of course, and watch this again and again. But did I hear you mention about consciousness is not, for instance, David, that it's something different? Say that again, the last part, consciousness um, is not. Not David or I, that it's, I always assume that consciousness and, and the self and, or David is, one and the same, even though it's all created by mind. So what is consciousness really? So you, sense? so my statement shaked up David. He's going, hey, you know, we exist. I think therefore I am. And so you're, you're um, um, self-testifying. And, um, mm -hmm. and so, so you, you have to be, careful about that um because you you have um this kind of a proof there, there was a, a a a satire group called fireside theater from the 70s and they had this play of this rightful edmund a shakespearean play and this person um he, so they're talking says how do i know if you're the real rightful edmund and he says well i have this dagger and that shows the proof and so then he reads it and it says i am he of who he speaks 
And he says, well, that's proof enough for me. And, and that's what you're doing with, uh, with your ego is you're saying, if I talk and I am he, then that's proof enough for me that I exist. The consciousness is, is neither ego nor not ego. It's mine. The ego is transitory. And, and we don't have to negate it, but we don't hold it up to this level that it is an individual independent life and being. It is simply mind in the machinations of how mind works. And so when we see that, that's the illumination of the mind that enables one to shine the wisdom of mind in the present moment. And one sees that this ego is not a real life and being, but a dream. And being a dream, it realizes that we are in this dream. The consciousness is a dream. And so, but here for the sake of this, we don't have to negate that as a, as a, a non-reality as much as it is a reality of mind manifesting in appearances, but those appearances are not per se uh, permanent. So they, they are not the the noumenon of mind, they're not the, the foundation of mind, but simply appearances. So, so we, we, you know, we don't hold those any longer than we hold the strawberry in our hand and say, this is me. This strawberry is me. You know, I'll come back next week and see if you want to eat that strawberry. Um, so, so it's a matter of you looking into this. So my answer to your question is yes, look into it. See, see where, it, where it takes you or doesn't take you, okay? All right, Weishan. Oh, uh, I, uh, I just want to make a comment. Um, you were talking about um, the teaching of our class is talking about, we go straight to the mind. And then it just make me realize that that, that is a I'm I mean, sorry, you, you broke up when you said that is. Oh, I, I mean, that, that's teaching. I mean, your teaching is to directly teach the mind. Or talk about uh, this mind, uh, mind work. But the, the Chan, I just realized it is mind work itself. Meaning you're talking about, you know, the, the teaching of uh, your teaching style is from the mind, working from the mind side. Uh, from the top, right? They'll go down. A lot of practices from samsaric side to go to mind. Teaching is from mind. Uh, uh, so everything else will be naturally. Uh, but that makes me think that's actually the Chan teaching itself. That is exactly what Chan teaching is. It directly point to the mind. And uh, uh, it, this is the mind. And then... Uh, um, Everything else, like you said, all those 37 factors and stuff and uh, will be naturally manifested. So I kind of just make the connection. I want to make that comment. Our, our forum, our class is direct. It is Chan. It goes straight to the mind. So yeah, I would say that the ultimate teaching is mind pointing towards phenomena. Yes. And that is Chan. Yeah rather than the finger pointing towards mine, why don't you be the mind looking at the tip of the finger? Yes. So you got it. You got it. That, that's, that, that is the path that you should follow. So that's good. You, there, that's a, a good epiphany because you not only got it, but you articulated it. So that was good. So just keep working that way. I mean, that's... That, Good job, Ruth. Hi, Ruth, 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 Ruth. <laughs> it's funny when you asked about the fire alarm, not any part of me in my mind thought that there was a fire because from the time I was in first grade to fifth grade every week, we had somebody call in a bomb threat. Um, they're in prison now. <laughs> so when every time I hear an alarm, I just think it's a drill. Um, if I'm in a building and I hear an alarm, it's a drill. It's not a fire. 
I've only been involved in two fires and there was never an alarm. Um, <laughs> and both times that I was involved in the fire, it was immediate like uh, assessing the situation, doing all the things you're supposed to do uh, with the fire, getting the uh, water hose and all those things. But when you said a fire alarm, immediately in my mind, it's a drill and there's no fire. <laughs> But that's how mind works, I guess. If you've been conditioned, like you said, you're conditioned. The conditioning for me was, is anytime I'm going to hear a fire alarm, I'm just going to leave because there's even a fire. I think it's just a drill. <laughs> now, now, here's, here's a, a little bit of a secret. Me knowing what you said before you said it is how mind works. You saying what you said is how ego works. Huh? So keep practicing. You're 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 on your way. Okay. <laughs> right, Sue? <laughs> so so it's very interesting. It, it's very interesting. The, the mind is capable of doing many, many things. But I did think about you, and that's why I mentioned the the, the school drill. Okay. So so you would know. All right. Ching. Uh, I go over. Uh, I would just want sort of like a follow up a little bit on the discussion just had about Sheng Xiu and the Hui Neng's famous verse. Um, to my understanding, since uh, Sheng Xiu, his verse is more focused on how to practice Buddhism. And uh, Hui Leng's verse seems more focused on talking about the Buddhism's emptiness. Um, I'm not sure if just do I understand that correctly or because the- You, you did, well, yes. Yes? Yes. So- yes. Um, so then uh, um, uh, Hui Leng was talking about there was not there is nothing at the first place. So where to catch the dust? So that means uh, things sounds like okay, Hui Leng he thinks there's nothing, nothing but dust. He admit there's dust, but there's no body, no mind, no heart, no nothing else, but there is dust. Does it mean that he admitted there's dust? You could say that what, what is e exemplified by Hui Ning's um, uh, presentation or his verse is a very deep, profound understanding of emptiness. Emptiness is not something that we just simply say or we do, whether it's kong or sunyata or emptiness, the word, it's beyond the word. It, and it, it is the, he is uh, presenting that from the viewpoint of the, of the mind's eye looking at the point of the finger and, and seeing everything as it is. Um, and originally that it is, it is and fundamentally empty of, of all um, um, independent nature. It doesn't negate the nature. What it does is it sees it clearly and understands that this, this nature or appearances that are being seen are empty, fundamentally empty. And it is this mind which is the buddha nature and if one um sees everything from the mind's perception which is a different perception from the perception of a sentient being a sentient being sees things from the viewpoint of subject and object the mind let's say we'll call it the buddha perceives everything simultaneously without a linear thinking of it, perceives everything immediately and sees it so clearly. And in this way, when it sees the things, it understands and illuminates it. This is the emptiness because 
there is nothing to separate the dust from the mirror. It is just causes and conditions that cause the dust to come off the mirror. But can it really? Can it really do that? And that's what Huay Ning was saying. What I was saying to Shifu, where, where did the dust go? It nevertheless is an appearance in mind, but it has its own reality in mind. Although it, we cannot say it has an independent reality, it is the understanding of the emptiness that changes the whole picture. That's where you should um, uh, engage your contemplation. You have a very good start, okay? Very, very good start. And, and I'm very happy the way this went because I was going to save this for next week um, about the but Hui Neng just naturally dropped in to the picture. And so it's, it's something that worked very, very well. But you may not understand emptiness completely, but you know where to look now, okay? Just keep playing this in your head, play it, play it, keep going over, over, over it, you know, just like a Huato in your head. Why, what, why is this? What, what happened here? And you just keep asking, what does that mean? What is emptiness? What is emptiness? And, and, and then looking for, for, for that. But you search mind, not the, the consciousness, but you search mind, you search the awareness and the mind will reveal emptiness. It will look right straight at that finger pointing at it. Okay. So I think we, I think it's kind of good because what I've been trying to explain to you, is, to all of you, is a very deep concept to, to be looking from this way down versus from this way up. Yes, Harry. Second, just wanted to, in terms of what you were talking about, mind and phenomenon. I just thought I'd read a very few lines from Sherfu's book, "There Is No Suffering," which is really relevant. Um, he says, indeed, everything is empty, but emptiness is wonderful existence. It is, price, it is precisely because our existence is illusory that we can experience enlightenment and help others to do the same. For this reason, emptiness is not other than form is more important to understand than form is not other than emptiness, in that the workings of the five skandhas are the full display of emptiness. So I think that's it's very, very important that that's the more important part of the formula, uh, according to Sherfu. That man was very wise. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. He knew what he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and it's always a joy, like when you hear something like that, and then you go and you see something, all of a sudden, what somebody said, you're amazed how much they learned since the last time you read that you know, and it's just amazing how more profound it is than the first time you read it. And it's just simply because this is, uh, I mean, he is, he is approaching it from, again, from looking at the point of the finger. And, and that's, that's probably a very eloquent way of, of him saying that and, and like flipping it around. And, and that's, that's important. And, and I would add to that, um, that when we talk about uh, consciousness is, is not other than emptiness, emptiness is not other than consciousness, it's the same thing. Emptiness is consciousness. So we flip it and the emphasis is there. And then, wow, that changes the whole picture in terms of how you see consciousness. And it, it explains what appears to be a contradiction, you know? Well, if it's not my mind, whose mind is it? You know, who's running the ship? But when you see this, we, we don't have to get to that question. It just simply merges. So excellent. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm very happy with what the participation today in terms of any other questions. Wendy, go ahead. Thank you, Gilbert. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, you said uh, looking from mind to uh, to the finger, 
And uh, then you mentioned something like uh, Gilbert, when Gilbert is out of the way, things run smoother. So I'm thinking, how do I um, look from, like, how do I put the self away, like put Wendy away? It's always messed things up. So from my point of view, uh, like just how to do it. Yeah, there, um, I wish I had the precise quote, but someone was asking a master about that. You know, when my, when my um, mind manifests a self, you know, what do I do? And the, the master was saying, just ignore it. When, just, and they kept asking, but if it does this, then finally he says, then just carry it out. So, so essentially what he meant by carrying out is not to push, push it out with a violence, but we illuminate the mind to see that the self is a manifestation, it's a dream. We think that we are the dreamer. And as a result of that, we don't have to do anything about taking out the self. But you need to be able to take the self out, you take it out by illuminating it. Um, and when you illuminate it, the self is like a cockroach in the kitchen, at, you know, at 2 a.m. in the morning. And you turn on the light, and what does the cockroach do? You know, and so it scurries away because it cannot stand the light on. And so the same thing with the self. I'm not saying you're a cockroach. But I'm saying that you have the same nature as a cockroach. Well, that didn't come out right, did it? Um, no, no, never mind. Uh, it, you know, there's a fear there, a fear of the light. And so when you shine the light on the self, then the self cannot maintain itself in the present moment. And Shifu used to say, to get rid of the self is to understand the self. And so that's very, very important. You have to understand yourself. When this happens, I have this emotion. When things don't go my way, I have these negative thoughts coming in. Um, and I don't trust myself or I create, I don't have these faith. Where did all that come from? That's not originally part of your package. So, so you just leave that alone. You illuminate it. And, and find the peace of the present moment. You don't have to win the lotto, you know, marry the most handsome man on earth, you know, have the most successful kids, whatever else we measure success for. Uh, you don't have to do that. The thing about us is all of us have good points and bad points. We have good fortune and bad fortune. Some of us have more bad fortune than good fortune. It's just the way it is. And we go, well, how is that? You know, you know, how is that that that's fair? It, it isn't fair in relation to if you look at just this lifetime, but if you look at the totality of karmic forces, then you, it may begin to explain things. And that's what's important. So when you understand those karmic forces, illuminate the self, see it, see it as it is, and maintain the calmness of your mind. You, little by little, your, your life quality will begin to improve tremendously. So, you know, you have a very good potential your yourself is the only thing that will hold you back but the self is just a ghost just subjugate the ghost just get rid of the ghost by illuminating it and you'll be fine trust me okay okay Ani. thank you gilbert uh so um in meditation the difference between thought and consciousness, can you define that or is oh, the same? Thought, thought is something, if you could say consciousness, 
Sometimes they, they refer to it, the Theravada referred to as Babanga consciousness. Um, and did I say that right, Santa? Babanga? Babanga. See, Babanga. <laughs> uh, consciousness is this kind of like an amplifier that's on. Now, it doesn't play music. It's just on. A thought it comes into mind is amplified by the consciousness. And so it appears in mind. How does it appear in mind? Does it, it may have mental formations of an image or it may be an emotion or a combination of the two. But that which is projected upon this consciousness is just mind. And mind is aware that this thought has arisen. Now, if it's a wholesome thought, a kusala thought, we allow it to stay in mind. If it's an unwholesome thought, an akusala thought, then we give it no energy or attention. We don't have to purge the mind from the thought. We illuminate that it's an akusala thought, not necessary to be perpetuated. And that illumination, oh, that's the enlightenment. The illumination of the mind, you're illuminating what is in the consciousness. So if you could picture the consciousness kind of like a ephemeral cloud and something coming into it, a thought. And when you see that the thought is there, the attention of the mind, the awareness of it says, this one we should let, allow it to stay. But if it's something that is an akusala thought and it's coming in, we don't put our mind attention on it. We look, oh, we don't look at it and it goes away. So when we to go back to Harry's, you know, do you poop or not poop? Um, one for the lack of a better analogy to it or description of it. If one needs to go to the bathroom, they sense the urge to go. It's not an akusala thought just simply because you have to go to the bathroom rather than eating a strawberry. It's just a function. And so, so if it's there, then you go, oh, well, maybe it's time for me to look for a restroom because this body is going to get rid of, of waste inside of it and I need to, to, uh, to deposit it. And so, so it just simply does that, okay? And when that's finished, it doesn't continue on with that thought because it's not necessary. It followed the function. But if it's an akusala thought, um, then it doesn't need to be there. And, and so it, um, you know, and you, you're looking at it and, and, um, and it's thinking of things as you're going to the bathroom or getting closer to the bathroom. Will I make it there or will I not? And so all, we've all had those situations. Um, so you, it, it's looking at that, but if it looks at that, then poof, you know, it, karma comes up. But if one doesn't think about that, just simply moves and And if you get there, you get there. If you don't get there, you don't get there. I mean, that just comes with age and, and stuff and comes more often in age than it did when you were a little kid. But in any case, uh, you'll get there. Um, it, it is something that, that we see that the consciousness is not a thought. It is what holds the thought in the mind, kind of like this kind of a, a, a cloud of consciousness of the potentiality of something arising and falling out of it. But when it arises, it will arise in the consciousness. Now, below the consciousness, you could uh, say there's a myriad of ideas that are, that are there. Um, we call them bija seeds, like, like as in the eighth consciousness, myriad of potentiality of thoughts that can come up. And if something comes up that's related to it, more likely another thought will come up that's connected to it, which they call an associative um, thought that comes up with that. And so there could be many associative thoughts and linking together, giving the idea that there is a mind stream. 
but it isn't really a mind stream. It is just in the present moment, these things are appearing, but just like as if you were running a, a reel of a movie, they're separate moments or thought moments. Okay. And, but when run quickly appear to give motion to it. Like the dream. We think we're moving all day, but we're not moving at all. But we think that. So this is a different way of looking at consciousness. It's, it's very interesting. But if you look at it this way, it begins to fit with all the other aspects of it, rather than holding on and saying there's illusory consciousness and that there's a real consciousness, the illusion arises within consciousness. The consciousness is neither pure nor impure, sacred or profane. It just is. And it is essentially this transparent mirror that allows things to appear. Okay. So hopefully that helps you. Oh, we got one late return here. Angela. Uh, hello, Gilbert. That was a pretty good trick. There you are. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm uh, so on that note of maybe if you mute your, huh? your if you mute oh, your speaker yeah. you can speak. yeah. um so if you if i could uh, i could add on the question to what you were just describing uh, or explaining to us then is mine so using your metaphor of the consciousness and thoughts arising how, how, how does mind come in so how does mind relate to consciousness the last part was how does mind what did, did anybody did, hear did you hear what i said just now the last the last little bit was a question you said how does mind and then i i didn't hear what you said if anybody heard it then Angela, your um, your signal seems to be on the low. So my side. question was, how does my to? Could you type your uh, question? Yeah, sometimes if you have your speaker on, you'll you'll hear a um, an echo when you when you unmute. Um, so I don't know if she's going to type or not. I, I don't see her. Yeah, she fell off the. I think we lost her 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 feed. So okay, your question will be answered the next time. Um, I'm I'm oh another one, Jian Ben. Go ahead. We're in overtime now. Go ahead. I don't recognize. Oh, hello. oh, okay, go ahead. Hello, Gilbert. Hello. Go ahead. Answer. Ask yeah, your question. Angela. Uh, sorry, I got disconnected. Yeah, my question is how does mind relate to consciousness? Or how does consciousness relate to mind? This is a very good question, you know, and it's a natural question after what we've been talking about, how it relates to mind. It is the um how mind contemplates the senses and um so you, you have to contemplate what i just said it is able not that how mind sees the senses but how it contemplates it there's a it's a a, a profound subtle distinction in contemplating the senses versus um, uh, experiencing the senses. Contemplating is seeing exactly why they are arising, when they're arising. And so this consciousness enables this ability to do this. It, in the Yogacara school, you could say it is the 
the feed between the eighth consciousness and the seventh consciousness where the eighth consciousness is a storehouse consciousness and uh, and the seventh consciousness is this kind of a mind uh, awareness but that mind awareness also incorporates the eighth consciousness they're not separate that's why in the higher state then there is not the seventh the first through seven consciousnesses because those consciousnesses are are fundamentally empty so i think my question probably leads to more questions but kind of contemplate that that this is this is not simple at all this is uh, you know this is mind work okay that's why i call it work and not mind fun or mind pleasure or, or mind games it, it is it is it is the utilization of contemplation to look at this if you can do this this is the shortcut it really is a shortcut to to the practice you know um some of you i think that are more progressed have probably can appreciate what i'm saying so others might be feeling like you're a little bit drowning but it's okay be be patient with it it will come in time okay just be patient with it and it will come to you you know don't be afraid of it you it it will come and it will it will pay off you know if you want to be a good boy scout or girl scout then just study the regular way you know and you won't cause not too much harm in this world but but this is uh the way to to a, a realization okay okay i'm going to finish up there thank you all for listening and you know again this was this was not chan uh 101 or the abcs you know we we're learning a whole different one uh and thank you debbie um we're going to make a, a, a time change um for the benefit of the people on the east coast um not a whole big time change but we're going to start at six to give you guys a chance to go to bed at, at a more reasonable time i can't push it beyond that because i i it, it's really hard for me to, to get here as as it is it's hard for me to push it to 6 30 but i'll i'll try six and so we'll start at six from now on and so if you know people that are aren't here uh please uh advise them of it of course we'll be sending messages out but that should give you a little bit more time to be able to to um uh uh go to sleep at a at a regular hour uh, although i don't think it'd be sleeps at what 10 30 well maybe some of you do if you're getting long in the tooth um but uh but in any case uh uh remember that for on the east coast i mean i wish i could do it earlier but i can't i you know i'm i'm working and, and people on the west coast are are probably rushing to get home to to be able to to do this as well so uh, we couldn't push it any further so we we'll kind of balance it okay so that's kind of where we're at um where is esther uh, when do i start the cmc lectures is it this weekend or next weekend hmm. she may not be there esther are you there oh there you are did you hear what i said you can't what? cmc lectures will begin in june four sundays june yep yeah. oh you've been rushing me all this time and i thought we started next week <laughs> she's a very good reminder of things but she starts reminding me very early okay that's fine june and we got plenty of time all right so that that would be the bodhisattva ones and those are going to be interesting because i've already started preparing for those lectures the cmc lectures and it's going to be like uh bodhisattvas like you've never heard them before <laughs> so i have to build it up like like a big picture or something you know transformers three or whatever so um anyway okay see you next week thank you all for your patience and staying with us